we have got a Q&A session with the Scriptorium team. Um, just a reminder that all of the sessions are being recorded and you can go back and watch any of them at any time. We'll drop the link into chat. So if you have any questions for um, Gretel Kinsey and Jake Campbell, who will be doing our Q&A today, you can put them into the questions module. Um, we will be going over questions that we have previously handled and gotten through email, but if you have any more, we'll be happy to answer them now. So, um, Jake and Gretel, are you there? Yes, yep, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Perfect. So I want to start off with a question that we had come in kind of throughout the conference. Um, what are the benefits of using DITA? Ooh, that's a broad one. It is. Um, I can go ahead and just start a little bit. I, I touched on this some in my intro to DITA session. Um, some of the major benefits that a lot of kind of different companies across the board can get out of using DITA one of the big ones is the idea of reuse. So being able to write content once and use that in multiple different places. And by having reuse available, you cut out a lot of inconsistency and you also can, um, you know, really cut down a lot of cost of having to have multiple copies of the same information in one place. And so I've seen, the you know, entire strategy sometimes based solely on the idea of just that one benefit of data reuse if you have a lot of shared or reusable content uh, within your content set. Uh, another benefit I've seen is the idea, and it's kind of related to reuse, of having a single source of truth. This is also uh, gets into the idea of your content existing separately from its formatting, but uh, you know, as I kind of mentioned with reuse, you write everything once and it all exists in one place. And when you publish it to different outputs, your formatting exists on kind of a separate layer from the content itself. So you just have that one content set and then your PDF output, your HTML, your web help, whatever ever kinds of uh, output types that you might have can all be published from that one single source of truth. Great, and we kind of have a related question. Why do you claim that DITA reduces translation costs? So yeah, there's actually um, several ways that that kind of goes about it. Um, Gretel just talked about reuse, and the way that primarily works is that you write something once and you reuse it in multiple places, which is different from just copy-pasting the same content throughout different parts of your documentation. Because when you copy and paste stuff, you still have to maintain all of that content separately. So if you update the content in one place, you need to make sure that it's updated across several places. Whereas if you're reusing uh, a, either a chunk of content or a whole topic, you translate it in, or update it in one place, it updates everywhere else. So if you have like a common boilerplate topic that you're using throughout all of your technical documentation, you only need to translate that once and then it gets updated everywhere. Whereas if you are just using the same content, but it's maintained individually across all of your different documentation, you're going to run into the fact that you're going to have to, you know, translate that however many times it's there, as opposed to just translating it the one time. Great. And so for people that are thinking about implementing DITA, how do you begin that project? This really uh, kind of depends on your circumstances. So I would say just the, the one way to begin is to do a lot of research and figure out if DITA is going to be a good fit for you. Some of the ways you can do that are looking at the content set that you have and then looking at the kind of place that you need to get to. So what your business objectives are and where your content needs to go to support those objectives. And then based on that, that's where you can kind of say, 
okay, what does DITA offer us and is that going to be a good fit for our content? Uh, so if you are kind of just first getting started, some of the things that you can expect um, did a, a, a sort of did a overhaul of your content, if you will, to include would be conversion. So if you've got, you know, your content in some kind of a desktop publishing based format, some sort of unstructured format, it will need to be converted over into DITA and, and have, uh, you know, have it fit the DITA content model. And that also gets into this whole idea of uh, information architecture. So conversion kind of happens in two phases. First, you've got to see how well your content fits the DITA model and whether you need to make use of things like data specialization. And then once that's been established and you've determined what exactly your data content model is going to look like, then you begin that process of migrating your content over. Um, then kind of once that whole process is started, you can sort of do this after or concurrently, you're going to need a way to manage the data content that you have. And that can be done, uh, you know, again, in a variety of ways, depending on what your needs are. So if you are thinking about things like budget, like the size of your organization, the amount of content you have, then there are all kinds of different content management tools that may be, uh, you know, a good fit for you, depending on sort of what, uh, what you need. Um, there are also things that you can do without an actual component content management system. So you could do something like managing your content and having version control that's not uh, you know, necessarily within a component content management system. Um, what you do get out of a CCMS that you wouldn't get if you didn't use one are a lot of workflow and publishing controls that you would have to sort of manage on your own if you didn't have one. So those are sort of the major things to consider are, um, you know, what are your business objectives? What are your publishing needs? What does your content look like? How much of it do you have? How well does it fit the data model? All those considerations are going to kind of shape the sort of path you take as you move into DITA. Uh, but as far as just the initial question, how do you get started? That's where you really do want to do as much planning and research as you can so that when it comes time to make all these decisions along the way about conversion and about content management and publishing, that you can truly make the best choices that are going to fit your organization. And Jake, I don't know if you have anything to add to that because it is quite a broad question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can really add on to that is I cannot emphasize enough the importance of doing your due diligence and building out your actual set of requirements. You know, why um, are you authoring things the way you are? Are there any particular structures that you can kind of build out as to like, you know, when we put together any kind of warnings or, you know, we're setting things off in a particular way from the surrounding content, why are we doing that? And asking those kinds of questions and being able to answer them is going to really help you pin down your needs and help you weed out things that aren't necessary. And that's really going to play a really big role in figuring out, you know, do we need a tool? What kind of scale are we looking at? And things like that. Yes, and definitely don't pick your tools and technologies first. We've seen that mistake <laughs> made quite a few times where we've sometimes had to come in and, uh, you know, a company has done that and then they've said, how can we fix this? You know, how can we get out of this mess we've made and, and choose something that fits better? And it really does, you know, come down to what Jake just said, which is, really, really think about those requirements up front and just do as much research as you can. Make sure that you know exactly what you need before you buy. Great, thank you. So we have another question from someone who says they want to hear more about publishing data into other formats than the basic PDF and HTML. Um, and they specifically asked, if you could give more information on how you publish e-learning content from DITA to the learningdita.com site. 
Okay, so um, the learning data site is hosted in WordPress. So whenever you're looking at getting your content from data into some deliverable format, the first things you always wanna do is take a look at what format that output is actually going to be. Um, so, you know, is it gonna be PDF? Is it gonna be HTML? But you can also look at turning it into whatever you want. Um, if you were in Amber Swope's previous session, she talked a little bit about the fact that a transform just turns data into something else. And the data OT is really just an engine that you can use to process the data that you have in data and turn it into something. So the format that um, WordPress expects for you know, the learning data site, it expects a packet of XML. So what we did is we mapped out the learning and training specialization to what WordPress wants on its side when you import a course, um, built out a uh, mapping, and basically we built out a custom transform that will take our data content and just kind of like process through it, output an XML file that we can then upload into WordPress. Um, there's a little bit of hand tweaking we need to do to get a couple things in place, but for the most part, it you know just transforms it into a target format that our target platform needs to consume. Right, and we also have, uh, I just want to mention that we have written up a case study of how we actually do this, and we can drop the link to that uh, into the questions module so that you can all get to it. Uh, but that's going to provide a lot more detail um, specifically on how we have published our content into the learning data site. Okay, great. So, there's another question asking about how someone should start a data project, but they specifically are asking about having a lot of content. Should they convert all of it? So this is really a, an it depends kind of question. Uh, if you've got a lot of content, uh, you know, one thing that we've always advised people to do is look at all the content you have and and see what actually is being used because you know there are a lot of companies we've seen that have decades old legacy content that they're not actually publishing anymore they just still have it in their archives so if it's really old content it kind of isn't being used at all anymore there's probably no case for actually converting that so that's kind of step one is sort through all the content see what you can eliminate that's not a candidate for conversion at all um, and then within that, you can also sort of prioritize, you know, what's going to be the most crucial content to get out the door first. And you can kind of look at the large content that you have and prioritize it that way. Um, and that's where this idea of something like a pilot project can really come into play and help you. Um, we've had, I've actually personally worked with several customers who've done this where they have said, you know, here is kind of a cross section of different types of content we have and it's also sort of the most important content that we have and we want to try converting that first so that we can really use that set as sort of a proof of concept to fine tune the conversion and um, you know make sure that that's all going to work as expected and then from there you can kind of look at how you want to convert all of the rest of your docs and um, you know, we once once you kind of get a rhythm going, you know, once you've gone through that sort of initial pilot or proof of concept and said, okay, uh, you know, here's how our conversion should work, it kind of does sort of get into this regular rhythm where you, you know, convert batches of docs at a time and then, you know, do any sort of quality control or cleanup needed on them and then sort of migrate them into whatever content management tools that you're using. Um, but as far as should we convert it all first, I would say the answer is probably going to be no unless your content set is really, you know, all high critical 
um, you know, constantly being used type of content. It's probably going to be this case where some of it needs to be sorted out and, um, you know, it's it's probably only going to be necessary to do a little bit first and then kind of take on all the rest in chunks as it makes sense for you. Um, and the reason for that too is because when you are doing something like moving to DITA, you tend to have a lot of things going on concurrently. So you're going to be doing this conversion process, but you're probably also going to be evaluating and choosing what kinds of content management tools you're going to use. You're probably going to be setting up, you know, whatever kinds of publishing output transformations that you need. And a lot of that work's going to be going on at the same time. So just from a resource perspective, trying to do one big conversion up front um, most likely is not going to make sense. Okay, and we have another question about um, converting content, and it might have kind of an unfortunate answer, but <laughs> do you know of any tools that convert PDF content to DITA? We occasionally are required to put text into DITA, and the only source text is PDF. As far as tools, um, I don't know any off the top of my head, but there are conversion vendors who can take content in a lot of different source formats, whether that's PDF, Word, InDesign, whatever, and uh, you know, create a script that converts that to DITA. If this is a case where it's sort of occasional, then it may not be worth the cost of doing something like that. It may make more sense to do it sort of manually one-off. But again, this is just really a question of it depends. Uh, you know, how often are you doing this? How much content is there that needs to be done in this way? Okay. Um, so when choosing a CCMS, um, does the information model need to be customized for the CCMS? <laughs> so I, I think this one falls under, you know, the unfortunately common response of, well, it, it depends. It depends on the CCMS that you're going to, um, because some of them are more directly data than others. Um, so it depends on what you're looking at. And you might want to take a look at what content you have determine and use that to determine which CCMSs would fit you better. Right, um, and I know that that can kind of blend into or bleed into your CCMS requirements as well because if you, you know, have a, if you really want to sort of develop your content model up front and not have to customize it for a CCMS, then you may have that be part of your requirements. Like you may want to look at, um, as you're shopping around for tools, you may want to say something or consider something like, we don't want to use a tool that requires us to customize our content model or to, um, you know, inject the CCMS's proprietary code into our files. So that's something to consider as well. But yes, it does depend on the particular tool. Yeah, and it it is troublesome sometimes if you do wind up in a situation where you're in a CCMS where there is some sort of CCMS proprietary element to the content that you have now. So it kind of locks you into that, um, which is something that you want to keep an eye on when you're making your assessments. Absolutely. So my next question, maybe for a team that isn't quite using a CCMS yet, but which output for smaller teams um, do you recommend to review documentation? So that depends a little bit on what your output looks like. Um, this sounds kind of like a, a content review, content QA situation. So if you're looking primarily at PDFs um, as your main kind of output, that's probably going to be more of a manual thing. Um, you may want to set up some sort of automated output like it's not unusual for some teams to have something that will run daily and output chunks of content that had been produced previously that day so that you don't have like a weekly or monthly dump of content that needs reviews. It kind of trickles in on a day-to-day -day basis 
so that designated team members, subject matter experts, or anybody who um, is basically designated to take care of that particular chunk of content can review it. Um, if you're looking at HTML output, you might have a script that can do, um, you know, like a bulk of testing, making sure that there aren't any broken links, ensuring that search functionality works, that kind of thing, and then have a human run through and spot check important parts, parts of your content in order to ensure that there aren't any gaps that were missed during automation. Um, but yeah, it, it really depends on what kind of content you're looking at because the way that you evaluate that content is going to differ. And that also depends on you know how frequently you need to check it and also the quantity of things that you need to check. Yeah, um, I, I wanna echo that too. Um, if you've got, for example, um, if you're not working in a CCMS that has some kind of a review workflow and you're just managing this on your own, and let's say you deliver, uh, you know, print-based or PDF output to your customers, then, you know, the obvious way to kind of review that would be to, you know, generate a PDF and then whatever kind of internal review workflow you want to put in place to look at that. It might just be, you know, comments on the PDF. You might have some kind of a system for reviewing it. But then, for example, if your main deliverable to your customers is HTML on a web page, then it wouldn't make as much sense to just generate a PDF for review because you may be missing certain aspects of, you know, the functionality of that on the web that your customers would be seeing. So in that case, you would want to generate HTML output and set up some kind of a test or review environment, maybe, you know, maybe put it on a test server and have everyone review it internally first before it goes live. Um, but it yeah, it does make sense to consider how you're actually delivering your content before you figure out what kind of review workflow that you're going to set up. Yeah, and I will say, regardless of what kind of content you're checking or the frequency or volume thereof, you really want to make sure that you have some way to keep track of what was tested when, by who, and the results. Because testing's all well and good, but if you don't keep a good record of the results of your validation tests, that it's going to be difficult to keep on top of like something went wrong, when did it go wrong, and where that particular break in the chain of custody happened, because otherwise you're not really, you're going to have trouble improving your, you know, your quality workflow, as, which is something you really want to keep in mind if you don't have some sort of tool-based assistance on this. Okay, thank you. So back to Dita as a general idea, um, this, this person wants to know if you've seen an implementation where all content creators within a company are using DITA, so technical support and marketing. Uh, yeah, I actually have. Um, I've worked, one of our clients, um, I've worked with both the technical department and also with their design department. So basically the tech side does all of the technical documentation for their various products, you know, making sure that all their data sheets are in line and all of their maintenance manuals. Um, but we also worked with them to develop an InDesign transform that their marketing and design department could use um, to create and maintain some of the more client facing things um, like you know and a manual that is more for someone who doesn't necessarily use the product but for someone who owns it and then other people in their organization use it so that they can keep track of like high level maintenance things and also keep track of maintenance records and things like that um, but I think it's also managed to branch out into some of their sales content as well yeah, and I, I've seen examples of this sort of thing as well. Um, at, sometimes it will be all content creators, or sometimes it will just be some departments, but it is becoming, I think, more and more common to see multiple different departments all sort of using DITA to collaborate with each other. And um, in fact, if you go back um, and watch the recording, if you were not able to watch it live, 
um, of the case study presentation that I did earlier for the Learning Digital Live event. Uh, that was with Barbara Green of ACS Technologies. And um, you know, we go into a little bit more detail on this sort of thing in that session, but that's one of their uh, you know, initiatives and part of their content strategy is to use DITA to help facilitate that cross-departmental collaboration and have multiple different groups aside from sort of the main uh, group that started using it, which was R&D, eventually all use DITA and, uh, or at least connect with uh, the DITA CCMS and collaborate with it. So um, yeah, that's, that's something that I think is becoming more and more common and that can be a really big advantage because it can kind of help with consistency, not within just one set of content and one department, but across an entire company. Right, because I mean, just in a broader sense, uh, customers and consumers are becoming more tech savvy. So it's not unusual for you to see like an ad for a car or truck and they'll tell you, you know, it's got this many cylinders, this is the mileage, this is the displacement of the engine. You're starting to see more and more technical content branching its way out into marketing content as a way to further engage and differentiate themselves to consumers. So, you know, DITA also is a good vehicle for reuse, so you can reuse your technical content in your marketing content and vice versa for those purposes. Exactly, and and just as customers are becoming more tech savvy and they're kind of wanting information from a lot of different sources, they also don't know or care where it comes from. So like they, as far as from their perspective, they don't care that you know marketing serves up this information and tech pub serves up this other information, et cetera. Um, they kind of just want the content they need. So if you don't have that alignment amongst departments within your company, then that's where you can kind of get some dissatisfied customers sometimes looking for information that they need. So uh, yeah, if it's at all possible to use something like DITA to help all these different departments collaborate and get all of their content more consistent and in alignment across the board, uh, then that would be really helpful for those companies to make sure they're serving their customers. And so speaking of users, we have a comment moving back to um, documentation review. Um, and this person wants to ask about um, not only testing on an internal server, by internal users, but also um, texting, testing on an external system, like testing for what the users would see and, and seeing how the system reacts there. Oh, well, so I would assume that when you're talking about testing internally that the server is located in-house or on some sort of like private hosted solution. Um, it would be possible if you had a hosted solution to have something that is less locked down and more outward facing, I guess would be the way to say it. Um, but you can definitely set up a test environment that would mimic something that a user would see more than um, just someone who's internal would be. Uh, I guess the most straightforward way to go about that is if you have, say, administrator privileges on a system so that completely changes the way you see the system. Uh, like if you go to a WordPress site and you log in with an administrator account, you're going to see a whole bunch of like sidebars and administrator tools that a regular user isn't going to see. So you could just create a non-admin privileged account that you could just go in and check with. And you know I've done that before in some previous testing I've done with other places I've worked before. So that's probably the most straightforward way to go about it, depending on what you really want to get out of this, you know, non-admin user-oriented testing. So you know, is it? like a physicality thing, like is there some sort of limitation on your network where you have limited ability to branch outside of your network? Um, so you might want to maybe have somebody do that remotely so they dial in from home or on Wi-Fi down the street or something like that. So that that's really, it depends on what you're trying to check for, but that's kind of the two scenarios that I could think of as far as how you would go about doing that. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so we had another question come in from someone who's at a company 
that merged with another company. So they're using two different authoring tools and have made the choice to go to one of them. Um, can you give them any advice about how to proceed? Hmm. Think for a second. Sorry, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this for a second. So they had two different authoring tools and they're trying to unify in a different tool. Yes, so it seems like they want Dita to support um, a certain software that they were using and they're converting to a new one. So they wanna know how to convert, you know, without breaking their current system. How how should they go about? Oh um, well, I mean it it depends on the feature because that that'll change what the what the actual content looks like because Dita in general supports a wide variety of things, but I mean it really depends on what feature we're talking about um, because there are some things that are completely tool based that are difficult to wrangle just out of the box in Dita, but there are some things that can be replicated on the data side out of the box. So depending on what feature that is. Um, so they specifically mention um, an inline like product. Um, oh, 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 are we talking about like, um, like basically using like a placeholder element for a variable or something like that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah, um, that actually is relatively straightforward. But um, so as far as like variableizing content goes, uh, there's a couple different directions you can go with that. But the primary thing is um, Dita supports the concept of keys, which are effectively variables. And the way that works is if you have a Dita map, um, you can put what's called a key map in your Dita map, and that'll contain a series of keys, each of which is indexed by an ID and contains something. Uh, it can be an image, a keyword, a pH element, um, something like that. And then when you go into your content, you can have an element. And you know, similarly as you would how you would set like a, an href attribute on an image in order to pull in a you know a local image of some description for display when it gets processed. Um, you can put that key in there so that it references out to it. And then when you process it, um, the keys will get resolved. It'll reach out up to the map, grab them, and pull that back down. Um, so that's probably a pretty good solution for that. But as to how to convert that, again, it depends on how that kind of variableization occurs in the original tool. Right. Um and one other thing I want to add there too, just about keys, because I know it's that is a really kind of advanced reuse technique that's difficult to get fully into in a Q&A session like this. But I do want to point out that we have on learningdata.com a two-part reuse course. And so the second of those two courses covers keys in detail and will walk you through how to actually set up and use those with kind of guided hands-on examples. And so if you go check out that course um, and you want to kind of get a better idea of how keys will work in the way that Jake was describing, that's a good resource to go to um, and maybe kind of figure out if that's going to work for you. Right. Okay, so next we have sort of a best practices um, question with data topics. Um, this person wants to know about short description. Um, They've, they've been told it should be used with every topic, but they don't see that this is always the case. Um, when should they or should they not use the short description tag? So uh, as far as using or not using the short description, I've, I've definitely heard it said before that you should always include a short description with your topics because it assists users in when they're going through and checking your content for like seeing just real quick because it basically functions as 
kind of like a mini abstract on the topic level. Um, but if you have a topic that's just a couple of sentences, it's it seems a little redundant to put short description in there. Um, but this is really more of a question as to how your content, um, like how your organization actually wants to author your content. So yeah, there are definitely some situations I could see where a short description could seem kind of redundant. Um, but the, the primary situation that's going to arise in is if the topic itself is very, very short. Um, but if you've got a longer topic or a topic that it's difficult to kind of glean the overall purpose of at a glance, a short description isn't a bad use there. Right. It can really help if you are trying to quickly search for, uh, you know, topics that cover uh, a particular thing. Um, if you've got a short description in those topics, especially if it is a very long topic, that can kind of help, uh, you know, you more quickly find what topic might be relevant. So that's kind of the, the use case that I would say for short description is, you know, as Jake said, do you do you really need to provide people that little tidbit of information, that little kind of quick at a glance piece of information that they need to kind of know what that topic is about if they're trying to kind of search through a lot of topics and quickly find what they need? Although um, I will say it is possible to use short description um, differently depending on your output. Um, if you, for example, are outputting to HTML and you link out to specific topics, uh, uh, it's possible to set it up so that when a user mouses over a link to a topic, um, the it could pop up that short description in the mouse over text. So it, it depends also on what kind of output you're going to. Okay, thank you all. Um, I don't see any new questions coming in. If you have a question, go ahead and type it into the questions module and we will answer it. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to remind everyone um, to look for the session evaluation survey in the chat module. And I also want to remind you that we're recording all of these sessions, so you will be able to access them after, and we'll put a link for that in the chat as well. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Well, in that case, I just want to quickly remind everyone, if you um, are looking for any more kind of data resources or you want to kind of have a quick, easy place to jump in, of course, check out our learningdata.com site. Check out the courses we've got on there. We have, uh, you know, everything from sort of a basic overview to, you know, introducing you to how to author different topic types. Uh, we've got a little bit about how to put your topics into maps, how to publish some basic output, how to do different reuse mechanisms in DITA, and we've also got some information about the learning and training specialization specifically, um, you know, as well as links to video recordings from last year's Learning DITA Live event, and then, of course, video recordings from this year's event will also be available. So if you just want a really, uh, you know, kind of good one-stop shop to get started on DITA and finding out if it's maybe the right fit for you or just kind of getting an idea of how it works, please check out learningdita.com. And, uh, you know, if you come up with any additional questions, please feel free to send that. And that's experts at learningdita.com. You can send us a question there anytime and we will be happy to answer it. Yes, okay, thank you, Gretel, and thank you, Jake. Um, I think that concludes our Q&A session and Learning Data Live 2019. Thank you all so much for watching and participating, and we hope you got a lot out of it. Um, that's it. Thank you.